Not so long ago, astronomers discovered a planet that got the name of UCF 1.01. This world is about 33 light years away from Earth. This makes the planet our next door neighbor, in the cosmic scheme of things, of course. Honestly speaking, the space body is only a planet candidate because astronomers haven't measured its mass yet. But they have high hopes. The wannabe planet is very different from our Earth. Just 1.7 million miles away from its star, it completes its orbit in a day and a half. It's a scorching, deserted world with the temperatures at the surface rising up to a thousand degrees. Even more astounding, the entire planet is likely to be covered in magma. Even if UCF 10… whatever ever had an atmosphere, it has definitely boiled away by now. But then, the question is, what if Earth once went through some catastrophic event and it left our planet in the same state, boiling hot with the surface covered by a thick layer of lava? Would people manage to adapt to such conditions and move to live underground? It sounds unbelievable, but experts are sure that with time, humans would turn into healthy and rather happy mole people. Of course, life would be very different than today. No more sunsets and sunrises. No more traveling by plane and space exploration, unless people found a way to launch a rocket from under the ground. No more picnics in the park or sunbathing at the seashore. People would have to build a vast network of underground tunnels that would connect major cities. The most likely transport in this new world would be silent high-speed trains and electric cars. After moving underground, people would have not only physical but also psychological difficulties. In the beginning, their new home would be a dark, barren place, without fresh air and devoid of any color. To adapt to these tough living conditions, people would have to make some design changes. Greenhouses, well-lit parks with trees and illusions of the sky, familiar scents and sounds. All this would help people to adjust to their new life. After living underground for several generations, people would start to look a bit different. Pale, because of the lack of sunlight, with sensitive large eyes adapted to dimmer lighting and more developed lungs. As for the very possibility of living underground, well, hear me out. You might imagine the Earth's depths as a huge mass of compressed solid rock. But the reality is different. This mass is heavily cracked. Water runs down the fractures and cracks in the planet's outer layer, the crust. Some of these streams reach the depth of many miles. In other words, subsurface Earth could probably support plant and animal life. If people lived underground, they wouldn't have a shortage of fresh water. Its reservoirs in the planet's interior contain 100 times more water than all the lakes, rivers, and swamps combined. Plus, this water trickles through the soil that acts as a purifier. But people would have to be super careful to keep the sources of water intact. Otherwise, the underground cities would get flooded and turn into giant water-filled traps. It would also be a great challenge to live without sunlight. Plants can't survive without the sun's ultraviolet light. It's absolutely necessary for photosynthesis because sunlight is used to get nutrients from carbon dioxide in water. One of the byproducts of this process is oxygen, the thing people can't live without. So no sunlight equals no plants equals no oxygen. Sunlight is also crucial for humans. For example, it helps your brain release serotonin, a hormone that boosts your mood and makes you feel focused and calm. Thanks to the ultraviolet B radiation in the sun's rays, your skin produces vitamin D. It's vital for a strong immune system and healthy bones, teeth, and muscles. That's why people would have to find a replacement for sunlight. Luckily, LED lamps that can give off UV wavelength could produce the light human bodies and plants crave so much. In the new underground world, there wouldn't be large sunlit fields. Instead, there would be sprawling greenhouses with LED lights shining from the ceiling. Special machines would feed plants and crops with recycled water rich in nutrients. In some areas, located in the narrow underground faults, 
people would use something like shipping containers instead of greenhouses. These containers would be packed with vertical rows of plants and blue and red LED bulbs. As for people, they would have to follow a vitamin D-rich diet. It mean eating a lot of egg yolks, cheese, fish, spinach, soybeans, and so on. If these foods weren't enough, vitamin D supplements would do the trick. Without daylight, people would have problems with their circadian rhythms that regulate sleep patterns. If you were isolated somewhere without a glimmer of light, you would easily sleep for 48 hours at a stretch. That's why people living under the Earth's surface would rely on artificial lights to control their internal clock. There wouldn't be any problems with electricity. It would be produced with the help of the Earth's inner heat. Such kind of energy is called geothermal, from the Greek words geo, earth, and therm, heat. It can be extracted from hot water and rocks. Like an onion, our planet is made up of several layers. The innermost part is a solid core around 1,500 miles across. Made of iron, it's surrounded by a scorching outer core. It's up to 1,400 miles thick and is mostly composed of liquid nickel and iron. The next layer is the mantle. Even though lots of people picture it as lava, the mantle is actually rock. But this rock is so hot that it flows, just like road tar. The temperature in the Earth's core is as high as 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's almost 1,000 degrees more than at the sun's surface. The mantle is also blistering from 7,000 degrees at the boundary with the core to 400 degrees in its outer parts. No wonder people wouldn't have any difficulties with transforming all this heat into electrical energy. But because the insides of our planet are insanely hot, people wouldn't be able to build cities too deep underground. All inhabitable areas would most likely stay closer to the surface. The Earth's outermost part, the crust, is like the shell of a hard-boiled egg. It's broken into gigantic blocks called tectonic plates. When two plates collide, mountains get formed and new rifts appear in the seafloor. They have different width, from 25 miles thick beneath the continents to 5 miles thick beneath the oceans. These blocks travel around, floating on the Earth's mantle, slowly, almost imperceptibly. It means underground cities would also move but it would be next to impossible to notice these movements. Oh, by the way, people started to believe there might be another world inside our planet in the 17th century. The idea got the name of the hollow Earth theory. It claimed that half the planet was taken up by its surface weight. Below the surface, there was some empty space. A small sun hung at the very center of that cavity, creating a comfortable tropical environment on the inner side of Earth's surface. One could enter the Earth's interior through one of the openings near the South and North Poles. A race of advanced humans was believed to live inside the planet. They were peaceful and lived for centuries. Well, obviously not humans. They had unique technologies, for example, flying vehicles. And since the climate inside the planet was better than that on the surface, this race was much stronger and healthier. Even though this idea sounds like science fiction, several famous scientists supported it. Some people are still sure there's another world inside our planet. But if the Earth was hollow, it wouldn't have a magnetic field. And without a magnetic field, solar winds would rid our planet of its atmosphere in the blink of an eye. This would leave our green planet deserted and uninhabitable, like Mars is. The magnetic field on our planet exists thanks to the processes going on in its very much not hollow center. Liquid metals are constantly moving in the Earth's outer core, generating electric currents. When the planet rotates around its axis, the electric currents form a powerful magnetic field. The sunward side of the magnetosphere is as large as 10 Earth's radii. And the other side stretches out in a magneto tail that spreads for 200 times the Earth's radius. Today, we're going to work our core, so get ready to sweat! Oops, sorry, wrong core. Hey, we've traveled far and wide, down to the Earth's inner core and up into outer space. But what if we could combine these adventures and find out what hides in the innards of other planets and moons in the solar system? 
With the help of this interstellar hyperdrill, we can achieve that, at least in part. Coordinates are in, all systems ready, and our first destination is… the moon. Our moon, in fact. We land on its gray and desolate surface under the black sky. No blue here, because there's very little atmosphere to disperse the light. The drill starts working, and we first go through the outer layer of the moon, the crust, just like on Earth. We're on the sunny side, so the thickness of this layer is only 43 miles. But were we to land on the dark side, it would be more than twice as thick. The moon is a rocky body, so its crust is largely made of silicon, iron, aluminum, calcium, oxygen, and magnesium, with much smaller amounts of other elements. Further down, we find the mantle, and it's a long and tenuous journey through. This layer is about 850 miles thick. It gets hotter as we go deeper, finding composite minerals, peroxine and olivine. They're made of iron, silicon, oxygen, and magnesium in different proportions. Finally, we break through the hard layers and into the semi-molten outer core. Another journey of about 93 miles ahead through this scalding swamp. And we dive into the iron ocean of the liquid core shell. It's nearly 60 miles thick, and the molten metal threatens to evaporate us. But this drill was made to sustain an extremely heavy onslaught. And that's how we finally come to a sudden halt. In the deepest reaches of the moon, there's a solid iron core, which is 150 miles thick. We could drill through it, but it would be unnecessary. So we just set the flag here and skip to the next planet on our drilling list. And it's Mercury! It was hot deep inside the moon, but on the surface of the smallest planet in the system, it's even hotter. That's because it's so close to the sun, of course. Alright, let's drill. Mercury has a pretty thick outer shell, which is both crust and mantle, going about 250 miles deep. Not the most fascinating journey, it's not unlike the Earth in many respects. But then, the drill stops, ramming into a solid metal wall. It's Mercury's core, which has a diameter of over 2,500 miles. It takes up to 85% of the planet's overall diameter. No use trying to drill through this one, it's fully metal and extremely dense. Skipping to the next planet, and we're on Mars now. Oh look, it's sunset here, and the sun is making the sky hazy blue. But you know the drill. I mean, we're here to drill. So that's what we do. Mars's crust is quite thin compared to Earth's, just 6 to 30 miles deep. Its composition is much the same, though. Iron, aluminum, calcium, potassium, and magnesium. That's one of the reasons why humans are looking to colonize the red planet one day. It's very similar to our own. We're very quick to drill through the first layer, and the second one, the mantle, is now upon us. It's a hard and rocky layer about 1,100 miles thick. Thanks to its size, Mars isn't seismically active any longer. There's simply no magma boiling close underneath the surface of the planet, making it silent and docile. It's a long dig, but we finally come to a screeching halt, bumping into the core. A ball of iron, nickel, and sulfur with a diameter of 2,000 to 2,600 miles. This core is bigger than that of Mercury, but the planet itself is larger too, so it figures. Okay then, our next stop is even more interesting, because it's… Jupiter. This gas giant has a mass twice that of all the other planets in the solar system combined. And we landed right in the middle of an ocean. The ocean, I dare say, it's the largest one in the whole system, and it's made of liquid hydrogen. The drill goes smoothly through the surface of the planet because there's no rock or hard metal here, only gas and liquid. But the shaking, yikes! The pressure on this planet is more than just huge, it's unimaginable. The drill is barely able to withstand it, and as it's going deeper, the pressure's becoming higher too. We've reached Jupiter's core, and it's nearly too much to bear. The temperature here is about 90,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the core itself is not solid but liquid as well, kept together by the immense pressure from all sides. The drill starts to rattle. Bad sign. Let's get out of here before it breaks. Whew. No winds, no pressure, no heat. All around us is a vast icy wasteland, crisscrossed by ridges and reddish bands. It's Europa one of Jupiter's most promising moons. As we drill through the ice, let me explain. Europa is one of the candidates to have extraterrestrial life in the solar system. 
and it can be found right beneath the icy shell through which we're now digging. It's only 10 to 15 miles thick, while down below is an enormous saltwater ocean, twice bigger than all of Earth's oceans combined. The deepest point on Earth is Challenger Deep, and it's a bit over 6 miles down. The ocean on Europa, on the other hand, can be up to 100 miles deep. Who knows what can be lurking in that deep, dark sea? Anyway, we travel fast through the water and finally reach the bottom of the ocean. The mantle starts here, and it's made of rock, just like on Earth. And not much deeper in, we find the metal core of the moon. Europa is a little smaller than Earth's moon, so it's no surprise we reach its center pretty fast. Okay, skip drive on, let's go further. Oh, I'd rather we drill in as fast as we can. Just look around, it's blazing here. We're definitely on Io, another moon of Jupiter, and the most volcanically active world in the solar system. Look, that volcano is twice the size of Everest, and it's erupting right now. Thankfully, we're under Io's surface already. But that's not to say we're safe. It's all molten down here too, mostly yellow and brownish hue, due to the huge amounts of sulfur. The stench must be horrible. Anyway, the most peculiar feature is that both inside and outside, everything's always on the move on Io. Jupiter and its other moons create tremendous tidal forces, making the surface of Io swell over 300 feet up and down. Like the largest tsunamis on Earth, only here it's not water, but rock. The deeper we go, the calmer it gets, though, until we're finally at the iron core. It's still hot here, but at least there's no shaking and swelling like above. Let's put up another flag and go to the next point. And that would be Saturn, the second largest planet of the solar system and the one best known for its spectacular rings. Not the only one to have them at all, mind you, but we'll get to it. Now, as you've surely noticed, our drill is simply falling down through the gaseous hydrogen and helium, making up most of the planet's surface and atmosphere. No need to work here. Just wait and hope the immense pressure won't crush our drill to a hunk of junk. At last, the pressures become so enormous that we find ourselves in the liquid hydrogen. And here, we start diving. Soon, we'll reach the solid core of Saturn. Ah, here we are. It's made of iron and nickel and is actually quite small compared to the rest of the planet. Well, the last destination awaits, so come on! And here we come, Neptune. The drill immediately deploys anchors, because the winds here are extremely powerful. They reach speeds five times greater than the most devastating hurricanes on Earth. Neptune is covered in a pretty thin layer of hydrogen and helium, just like Saturn or Jupiter. But underneath, there's much more than that. It's hot, windy, and lonely here on the outskirts of the solar system. So let's dig already. Beneath the gases, there's suddenly a bubbling hot mass of water, methane and ammonia. Pew! These substances are hot, despite Neptune being called an ice giant. The name comes from its core. Deep inside, where we're quickly headed right now, a small ball of rock and ice sits all alone. And despite the boiling temperatures above, the ice beneath is ever cold. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are stripped away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. Some time before the explosion, you're hovering in almost complete darkness. Below, you see the moon or what you think looks like the moon. The surface of this light-colored sphere is pockmarked with craters left by meteorites. You see huge, steep hills stretching for miles. It's Mercury, and right now, you're going to explode it. As if in slow-mo, you watch the planet fall apart. And then, in the blink of an eye, you see a wall of debris closing in on you. First, giant chunks of rock, those are all that's left of the planet's solid crust and rocky mantle. The appearance and structure of the debris flying in your direction changes. Now, the stuff looks liquid, like splashes of quicksilver. That's Mercury's metallic core bursting apart. It used to take up 85% of the planet's volume. 
And finally, it's a firework of solid pieces again. It's the planet's solid core. The explosion is so powerful, it knocks Earth into a different orbit. The sun hiccups and swallows down an enormous cloud of dust. That's everything Mercury has left behind. But don't worry, our solar system won't lose any planets. This whole explosion thing is only a temporary experiment. Once you're done watching the show, you press another button and the planet gets back together, as if you've hit rewind. You approach the next planet on your way. Its surface is hiding under a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. If you decided to land on Venus, you'd watch thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. You'd see the planet's surface, reddish brown, dry, and incredibly hot. You'd probably walk across flat, smooth plains, covering two-thirds of the planet's surface. You'd gawk at volcanoes littering Venus, all 1,600 of them. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do that, because you press the button. Boom! Huge chunks of basalt fly away from the center of the explosion. That used to be the planet's 12-mile thick crust. Then you spot bright burning meteors flying towards you at incredible speed. Those are chunks of Venus's molten rocky mantle. The fire rain seems endless, maybe because the mantle was 1,200 miles thick. But that's not the most massive part of the planet. The power of the explosion forces apart Venus's metallic iron core. This core used to be twice as wide as the mantle. You reach the blue marble of your home planet. What will its insides look like, scattered in space? From above, Earth looks pretty. 71% of its surface is blue, because of all that water, seas and oceans. There are also areas of green, yellow, and brown and white swirls. You press the button. The planet bursts apart in a hailstorm of rocks. They're what's left from Earth's thin crust and much, much thicker mantle. It used to take up nearly 84% of the entire planet's volume. You see the rocky rain change into something way more liquid. It's scorching hot iron and nickel that used to make up Earth's outer core. The metals weren't under enough pressure to be solid. The bang is so powerful that it takes apart Earth's inner core. It used to be a solid ball of iron and nickel. After the pieces fly apart, they follow their own orbits around the sun. The most massive chunks crash into the moon, and some travel further and get swallowed by our star. You can't linger. The red planet is waiting for you. The surface of Mars is covered with rusty colored dust. The thickness of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's seven feet thick. The ground is colored gold, brown, tan, and even greenish. The hue depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. Bang! Mars is a rocky planet. You have to dodge mountain-sized chunks of crust made up of volcanic basalt rock. What you see next looks as if you've blown up huge amounts of soft, rocky toothpaste. That used to be Mars's mantle, composed of oxygen, silicates, and other minerals. And then, the flying pieces get solid again. Ah, it's the planet's core's turn. It was solid, made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. Billions and trillions of fragments of all sizes, from a small moon to pieces several feet wide, get launched in all directions. But only very few parts have enough momentum to leave the solar system. The whole event slightly changes Earth's orbit, and the temperature on our planet goes up by 18 degrees Fahrenheit. You leave rocky planets behind and close in on the first gas giant on your way. It's Jupiter. Thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds hide its surface. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. You hit the button. This time, the view is different. Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away to space turns liquid. 
That's hydrogen changing its form under immense atmospheric pressure closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, the liquid is already a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It was probably Jupiter's core, 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The gas giant's diameter was about 90,000 miles, but the blast lasts no more than half a second. The explosion of Jupiter is so strong, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The Sun remains pretty much untouched. It gets hotter and kind of unstable for a bit, but it doesn't last long. The next gas giant on your way is Saturn. At first sight, it looks as if the planet has a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by layers of clouds. Saturn's trademark rings are awesome and colorful – gray, beige, and tan. They're actually groups of tiny ringlets that are made up of floating chunks of water, ice, rocks, and dust. These chunks range in size from specks to massive skyscraper-sized pieces. While orbiting Saturn, they keep colliding, and larger pieces get shattered. You're surprised to see that the rings aren't perfectly round. They have bends caused by the gravitational pull from the nearby moons. 53 of them are confirmed. Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury, is the largest. What you see looks eerily similar to what happened when you exploded Jupiter. There's only one difference. Saturn's rings break apart, sending rocks and ice flying into space at incredible speed. The largest pieces crash with the planet's moons, wiping away the smallest of them. You see streams of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, with a bit of methane, ammonia, and water. They're moving at breakneck speed away from where the center of the planet used to be. After that, splashes of liquid matter, that's liquid hydrogen, that later turns metallic. And finally, the chunks of the solid core made up of rocky materials. You're looking at a beautiful blue-green sphere of the ice giant Uranus. The planet gets this unusual hue when the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Plus, Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, with traces of methane gas that absorb the red light. Anyway, bang! This time, it's massive blobs of ice that are hurtling in your direction first. They used to be the part of the planet's ice mantle that once made up 80% of the planet's volume. But why does this ice look liquid? On Uranus, frozen liquid isn't solid like on Earth. Ice is a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia ice, and methane. It's often called the Water Ammonia Ocean. After the bizarre ice rain, you see solid pieces of the planet's rocky core. It used to be small, no more than half the Earth's mass. Some of Uranus's moons get pulverized in the explosion, and several even get ejected out of the solar system. The explosion also slightly shifts Neptune's orbit. And the last planet on your way, Neptune. It looks blue because of a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. No time to linger. Boom! The planet doesn't have a solid surface. That's why, after pressing the button, you see Neptune's liquid mantle bursting. It looks like a water-filled balloon thrown down from the 50th floor. This sends splashes of water, ammonia, and methane ices away into space. It's followed by lava-like remains of the planet's mantle. It used to be liquid, red-hot, and rich in methane, ammonia, and water. That's what's left from Neptune's solid core made up of iron and other metals. 